so much, Sable. It is so exciting to be here as a part of Writer's Conduit and especially to participate in believable world building. If some of this is a little, if, if you guys have questions or I'm going too fast, please let me know. I tend to talk very quickly. What made you want to write for kids? So today what we're going to be covering is we're going to be talking about who can critique and kind of what are the different types of critiquers who are in the world around us. So for example, this is Pelagia, Homeworld of the Sky Rays. I've been doing creative writing workshops here in where I live for a long time. It's always been this kind of format where you set a timer, write whatever based on the prompt, and then we go around, open like, and just kind of read what we wrote. So we're talking about cover art today. Cover art can attract readers or repel them. As much as we like to think people won't judge a book by its cover, we know it's true. As far as I can tell, the best definition of what neurodiversity is is any form of differentiation in brain function. We are here to discuss NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month. This is the traditional versus independent publishing panel. I'm really into the academic side of uh, mythology as well as the more fun storytelling side. When you hit somebody, it makes a distinct sound. If you hit them in a certain place, it makes a distinct sound. Come to Writer's Conduit, finding your online community. Thank you much, so much, Sable. It is so exciting to be here as a part of Writer's Conduit and especially to participate in believable world building. If some of this is a little, if, if you guys have questions or I'm going too fast, please let me know. I tend to talk very quickly. What made you want to write for kids? So today what we're going to be covering is we're going to be talking about who can critique and kind of what are the different types of critiquers who are in so, for example, this is Pelagia, Homeworld of the Sky Rays. I've been doing creative writing workshops here in where I live for a long time. It's always been this kind of format where you set a timer, write whatever based on the prompt, and then we go around, open like, and just kind of read what we wrote. So, we're talking about cover art today. Cover art can attract readers or repel them. As much as we like to think people won't judge a book by its cover, we know it's true. As far as I can tell, the best definition of what neurodiversity is, is any form of differentiation in brain function. We are here to discuss NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month. This is the traditional versus independent publishing panel. I'm really into the academic side of uh, mythology as well as the more fun storytelling side. When you hit somebody, it makes a distinct sound. If you hit them in a certain place, it makes a distinct sound. Come to Writer's Conduit, finding your online community. Thank you much, so much, Sable. It is so exciting to be here as a part of Writer's Conduit and especially to participate in believable world building. If some of this is a little, if, if you guys have questions or I'm going too fast, please let me know. I tend to talk very quickly. What made you want to write for kids? 
So today what we're going to be covering is we're going to be talking about who can critique and kind of what are the different types of critiquers who are in the world around us. So for example, this is Pelagia, Homeworld of the Sky Rays. I've been doing creative writing workshops here in where I live for a long time. It's always been this kind of format where we can set a timer, write whatever based on the prompt, and then we go around, open like, and just kind of read what we wrote. So we're talking about cover art today. Cover art can attract readers or repel them. As much as we like to think people won't judge a book by its cover, we know it's true. As far as I can tell, the best definition of what neurodiversity is is any form of differentiation in brain function. We are here to discuss NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month. This is the traditional versus independent publishing panel. I'm really into the academic side of uh, mythology as well as the more fun storytelling side. When you hit somebody, it makes a distinct sound. If you hit them in a certain place, it makes a distinct sound. Come to Writer's Conduit, finding your online community. Thank you much, so much, Sable. It is so exciting to be here as a part of Writer's Conduit and especially to participate in believable world building. If some of this is a little, if, if you guys have questions or I'm going too fast, please let me know. I tend to talk very quickly. What made you want to write for kids? So today what we're going to be covering is we're going to be talking about who can critique and kind of what are the different types of critiquers who are in the world around us. So for example, this is Pelagia, Homeworld of the Sky Rays. I've been doing creative writing workshops here in where I live for a long time. It's always been this kind of format where we can set a timer, write whatever based on the prompt, and go around, open like, and just kind of read what we wrote. So we're talking about cover art today. Cover art can attract readers or repel them. As much as we like to think people won't judge a book by its cover, we know it's true. As far as I can tell, the best definition of what neurodiversity is is any form of differentiation in brain function. We are here to discuss NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month. This is the traditional versus independent publishing panel. I'm really into the academic side of uh, mythology as well as the more fun storytelling side. When you hit somebody, it makes a distinct sound. If you hit them in a certain place, it makes a distinct sound. Come to Writer's Conduit, finding your online community. Thank you much, so much, Sable. It is so exciting to be here as a part of Writer's Conduit and especially to participate in believable world building. If some of this is a little, if, if you guys have questions or I'm going too fast, please let me know. I tend to talk very quickly. What made you want to write for kids? So today what we're going to be covering is we're going to be talking about who can critique and kind of what are the different types of critiquers who are in the world. So, for example, this is Pelagia, Homeworld of the Sky Rays. I've been doing creative writing workshops here in where I live for a long time. It's always been this kind of format where we can set a timer, write whatever based on the prompt, and then go around, open like, and just kind of read 
what we wrote. So we're talking about cover. Alrighty, welcome in. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Lady of Zombies. I will be both your host and panelist for this session. Uh, this session is novel writing for EFL and ESL or ESL and EFL writers. Um, however, that title may be a little bit uh, more vague than I uh, anticipated. Um, so in specific, uh, just for clarity's sake, we are going to be talking about novel writing for EFL and ESL writers in regards to teaching students. So any of you who are educators or working with teaching kids how to do things, this is the panel for you. Uh, also, as I was setting up this panel, as I was going through and um, <laughs> oh, welcome in writer's conduit. <laughs> but uh, as I was going through and setting this up, I realized that a lot of the skills, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is also applicable to non-EFL, non-ESL writers. Um, the difference is going to be in how you're differentiating that, what level you're doing it, to what extent you're doing it, and the kinds of materials you're using as you're introducing uh, these topics to your kids. Um, <laughs> but hello, welcome in everybody once again. Those of you who are normally here, please do respect the rules for today's stream. Those of you who are new, um, we normally don't do writing content on this channel. Um, we are big, huge fans of Coffee Quills and Closet Forge, uh, The Lady Writes, lots of other people, but um, I tend to usually stick to gaming, so I will, you know, if you're into that, feel free to follow, but um, please don't follow if you're expecting more of this content on the regular. That said, I am super nervous. Let's get started before I... <laughs> <laughs> before I just, you know, panic. So let's get going. Um, this panel, of course, is once again, novel writing for ESL, EFL writers, specifically when talking about teaching students how to do these things. All right, so let's go ahead. Let's get started. Uh, for about me, uh, I'm a University of Oregon graduate. I did major in Japanese language. Um, I'm now an English teacher in Japan. Um, I've also studied at places like Japan Women's University and through University of West Florida. Um, and I've been teaching English as a second and English as a foreign language in Japan for eight years now. Um, there is a differentiation. There is a distinction for those of you who might be confused. Some of my students do come from families where English is their first language and Japanese is their second. So this is why I've added this, uh, this, this distinction here. Alrighty, let's go ahead. Um, a little bit more about me. I am bisexual, so I am a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, I also have ADHD, which is kicking my butt today, and I'm real worried about that time, so I'm going to keep going. Um, I've been in Japan, this is my ninth, ninth, eighth? Ninth year in Japan total, eighth year continuous. So I've been in Japan for a long time. I've been teaching and working with, again, these EFL, ESL kids for years now. Um, full disclosure, <laughs> while I've always really enjoyed reading, books were my escape. Books were how I, you know, I dealt with life. I have never actually published anything of my own. So, you know, the joke applies that those can't do teach. But I really feel that my experiences with reading and having written things, even if I have not published anything myself, have really helped me to be a better teacher when it comes to knowing what needs to be taught, what needs to be done, and helping the kids figure out what to go. <laughs> Realm, thank you very much. I am super nervous. As you guys can tell, I've got my best teacher voice on today. I promise not to give you the teacher look, but we are nervous, so we're just going to keep going. <laughs> uh, so these uh, throughout the slide, you're going to see some covers that students have made in my class. <laughs> Spectre, no. <laughs> Ask questions later. This is not question time. Uh, I have got some covers from uh, books that my students have written. I've gone through and used NaNoWriMo Young Writers Program to help over 50 students publish their novels. Um, at my current school, we've not done NaNoWriMo yet. Um, I'm making it a part of the curriculum from next year for the equivalent of high school first year students. And I'm real excited. Um, but as of this year, I've helped more than 100 kids learn to write stories 
and we've published those stories on our school's homepage and we presented them and shared them. And so I've gone through with a lot of kids on how to do this stuff in the past four or five years that I, since I've started teaching this kind of content. So what do we need to keep in mind? What do we need to go through? What do we need to look at? What are the steps that as teachers, we need to make sure we're taking when we're going through and we're starting to teach this? Um, this said, I'm going to pause for one moment. Remember that ADHD thing. <laughs> I'm nervous. I have time blindness. I might talk too fast. <laughs> if I'm talking too fast and you don't catch something or you need me to repeat something, please feel free in chat to let me know. I believe the highlight my message is currently only 10 biddies. Uh, not biddies, 10 bonies. Sorry, that's our channel points. So if you need to say anything and get my attention, please do use that at any point during this presentation. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm breathing. I'm trying to breathe, but I'm way more nervous than I anticipated. So let's let let's get started. So, whoop, nope, nope, not modeling. There we go. First, we're gonna start off by looking at background. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Realm. Thank you for being my dragon. Um, alrighty, so when you introduce story writing tasks, whether they're short stories or long stories, students of all levels are either 100% terrified or 100% excited. And with ESL and, EFs, ESL and EFL students in particular, they tend to lean towards terrified. They, they think they don't know enough grammar. They don't know enough language. They don't know enough about how to write stories in the target language. But I found like by working through this in a manner of going from the familiar to the unfamiliar, you can really help the kids to break down and make things more understandable for themselves to make the less of this big giant scary world it's not so much about the language they don't know but the language they do know and the messages they want to share so starting off with things like familiar stories like for example choosing fairy tales or folk tales or movies from their own cultural background and starting off with using those as a point of examination, even if those materials are not in the target language, can really help those students to start to look into and inquire into what does a story need? What kind of language, and by language in this case, I'm saying like word choices, not English, French, Japanese, whatever. What kind of words do you need? What kind of transitions? How do you start something? How do you show there's a problem? What kind of language can we use? What does it look like? What is the format flow of, of a book? So using some kind of model, something that's familiar to the kids, whether you yourself personally know it or not, the students know it and they're able to break down and go through and identify that stuff. If like me, you're in a lucky situation where all of 90% of your students have the same background and those who do not have that same background are still have had a lot of exposure to it you can then choose things specifically from that background to work with but if you are in a mixed classroom it is more than okay to let the kids use books use stories that you don't personally know if you're worried about it you can ask them to share the name of the story try to find that in an english version for yourself but the kids are usually really a lot more confident if you let them use these kind of model novels, model stories, these kind of model mentors, which we're going to come back to later as well. Um, so what's next? After we go through background, breakdown. So we've, we've gone, we looked at our background, we found stories. What do we like? What do we not like? What does a, what is a story? We have to make sure that every kid is on board with what does a story need? And again, this is true whether you're teaching elementary school students in English as their first language or whether you're teaching it to high school juniors, high school sophomores who are writing their first stories in English as their second or foreign language. 
And a lot of times this is really common sense, right? You need characters. Talking about characters can help the students to use descriptive language, describe actions, help them learn to describe different senses. Um, and it gives them a chance to explore their own self, their identities in a safe place where they're not being judged. Uh, it also needs a setting, of course, and this helps the students when they're writing their stories, it helps them learn how to use that more descriptive language. You can also give them a chance to learn, depending on their level, more advanced techniques in their writing. So, for example, um, at my old school, I had mostly ESL students uh, in a lot of my classes that I was teaching this with. And for them, we really got a chance to practice things like front shifting, which is taking the most important part of a sentence that would usually come in the later half of a sentence and moving that to the front of the sentence with a comma, right? So instead of saying, oh yeah, I'll go to the doctor today, it's, oh yeah, uh, today, I'll go to the doctor. That's, that's maybe not the best, most eloquent example, but taking that important information, moving it to the front. Um, things like using showing versus telling, how to use the, that kind of adjectives, those descriptions that explain about a world, uh, how to create tension, how to create mood. Uh, and it can also help the students become better at describing those familiar and unfamiliar scenes. When we're talking about the problems and the solutions in the stories, this also helps the students to be able to write better when it comes to sequen sequential writing, like what happens first, what happens next. It helps them to practice dialogue. It helps them to practice exploring their, maybe their problem has something to do with identity. They can help explore identity and come to these conclusions or share these conclusions that, you know, it's okay to be yourself. It can help them represent their own culture. Uh, I've had students who actually have done this with their writing. Uh, I had one student who, it was um, of mixed background. They were Japanese and Thai, and they've spent their whole life in Japan, and they really wanted to explore that Thai side of their life and their background and their culture and their, their history. And so they really went to work kind of exploring that other side of themselves and finding things like symbolism or stories or different things in that culture that they could really relate to. And they used that information they found to write this really amazing story um, that really relied on that culture and it helped them to understand better about themselves and their own, you know, their own cultural roots. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, of course, a lot of you guys who are listening our teachers, a lot of you who are not, may not, you know, this might be new information, this might not be new information to some of you, but it is really important to break it down for the students. What am I learning by talking about a character? What am I learning by talking about a scene? If the students don't understand their learning goals with these, or if they don't understand what is the point of practicing this, they're also going to be less invested. Something else that breaking it down, talking with the students about all this, and then letting them do it for themselves. It's really important to note that this is all 100% authentic English, which a lot of times, in my experience teaching English in Japan, the English we use is not always authentic. We're oftentimes required to have students produce language based on a a model like you have to do like this you have to do like this you have to do this for this purpose and the students don't really see the point they're not yes they're not always necessarily creating something 100 percent authentic but this even with the weaker students gives them a chance to make something that is completely their own and use english in a way that really helps them to hold on to what they learn, to make it their own, and to realize that I can use English. I can communicate with this, even if it's not perfect. 
It also, as a side note, does help improve their reading and analysis skills. At my, again, at my old school, I was the writing teacher. And their reading teacher told me, the, the couple years I was doing this at that school, that the students who had gone through the writing program before I was a teacher there, that they were all terrible at X, Y, Z when it came to reading. And they always had trouble with this, this, this. And the students I taught at that school, going through, teaching them how to write stories, it, they, from what he said, they, t they improved in all of their reading skills. They improved, especially when it came to analysis, because they not only knew a story needs a character, but how can you use a character to tell you something? How can you use a setting to explain an idea or to change the mood? And they really were a lot more eager to do their reading because they, at a basic level, understood better what they were looking for and how to figure out why the author might have done it because it's really important to do this. They themselves are authors. We talk to the students, we say, you're an author. As an author, what did you do? And that really has helped them to improve and kind of make it their own and make it something that they were excited about. I do need to move on, so let's keep going. One resource I use when I am going through and I'm teaching how to write is the National Novel Writing Month's Young Novelist Workbook. This workbook is ridiculously amazing. It goes through and it really breaks all of this down step by step. There's practices, there's explanations. So like, here's some explanations. I'll just, as I'm talking, I'll show you. So it tells you, what is this? What does it look like? And it asks you to try it for yourself. And this really helps the students because we know what it is, but maybe we've not had it explained to us. We've not had to think about wait, how do I show mood? We've been asked, what is mood? We've asked, what is the, you know, what is the feeling of the story? But we've not practiced having to make it. So this workbook really does go through and it talks about things like mood, external conflict, internal conflict. Um, even the word said makes an appearance. Said is not dead, according to this one. <laughs> Um, but it goes through and it breaks all of this down. It gives the students chances to practice their writing about characters, their descriptions, all of that stuff. And this is also available for free for teachers. Um, and you can print out copies. Let me just, boop, I'll copy that for you guys. Put it in chat. This is a free resource that is really amazing and has really improved my own teaching of the subject. Um, Let's keep going. Go, go, go. go. Oh, oh, we gotta switch through all that again. Alrighty. So the next thing, again, we've, we've talked about use the student's background, break it down for them. That breakdown is really important. It gives them that confidence that they actually do know what a story needs and how to go through and do that. But something else throughout this entire process that's really important for EFL and ESL students in particular is modeling. For the students, have them choose a book that they like in a genre that maybe they think they might want to write in. And throughout their writing journey, this book is their personal mentor. So they can go through and anytime they're stuck, I don't know how to change scenes. I don't know how to start a new chapter. That's actually a really common question I get. How do you stop a chapter? How do you start a chapter? I ask them to go and check their model novel. What does this author do? How do they do it? What are some different things they do? And we look through it together and see, oh, there's this kind of style, there's this kind of style. And we think, okay, what style do you think works the best for you? I've had students who don't know how to start a book. So they looked at how their model novel does it, and then they try something similar. In this case, we think of the model novel as their personal mentor. Once again, it would be good for their English level, if they're able to, to choose a model novel that is English. 
But if your students are not at a level where they're able to really read something of that, or they're not comfortable doing it in English, their model novel can be in their native language. Because even if the word choices don't, you know, apply to English, the, how will people write? How we change chapters? How we start stories? It is the same no matter what language. So their model novel does not have to be in the target language. Um, and once again, it also lets them use the familiar. Things they like, things they know. So there's no bad model novel, right? There's students, if they really don't want to use a book, they can look to things like folktales, film, animation, even video games, crazy as it is. But books do have the advantage of being able to be accessed anytime when they're in the classroom or at school. This using the familiar does apply to when you're talking about that breakdown, when you're talking about characters, when you're talking about setting, you can use all different kinds of models. It is not limited to writing. This is familiar for them, so it's safe, it's comfortable. It makes it easier for them to take these ideas and use it. And it also helps the students to, you know, feel good about their background, their interests, and make them feel like they really, again, they do know what it is we're talking about. So I feel like these are the three most important things with the writing when you're teaching this to the kids, going through, making sure we're using their background. We're breaking everything down for them. And as we're breaking it down, we're teaching them those skills. So while you're talking about characters, we need characters. What does a good character have? Anybody? Any ideas, chat? What does a good character need? I'll give you 30 seconds on the clock. What does a good character look like? If coffee closes here, coffee might be able to answer this one. They've done presentations for my classes before. A character needs a plot. A good story needs a plot, yes, but a good character. What does a good character need? Right? We need a background. Where do I come from? Right? What is happened in this character's life? In that background, we're also building what kind of person are they? So if someone is nice, right? a balanced diet, Itachi. <laughs> Yes, okay, your characters need balanced diets, but they need a good description, right? A visual look. We need to be able to describe them. So you can go through and work on that language. How do you describe a character? And I have this activity I like to do where I give them a very vague description and say, okay, now draw it in your book. And they all go, what? I can't draw that. There's no information. I'll be like, oh yeah, they're they're short but not tall, or they're tall but not short. They're a little not tall but not short. Oh, you know, they're a little they're a little big, but you know, they're not fat. Or like, oh, and they, you know, they're a little bit like bald. Okay, now draw it. Or I'll give really bad descriptions like that, and that helps them to realize that when they describe a character, they need to be able to visualize it, like Lord Galacron said. Um, Spectre, they need an identity, yes. So we can't just say, oh, they're kind, lol. We need to show that they're kind, right? If a, if someone is maybe anxious, but they're also really kind and caring, how do these mix in a story? And in that, um, that link I shared to you guys earlier, that NaNoWriMo textbook, there is an activity I really love. Uh, give it a moment to load. Where did that go? I wasn't planning to show this one, but where is it? Da, 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 da. This is also the updated version of the book, so things are a little bit different than the last time I did the book. Details, details, details. Where did it go? Character interviews. This can help kids build background. Where are we going? List, list, lists, list, list, list. I uh, can't find it right now. Okay, we're gonna we're just gonna skip that. We'll go back. But one activity I really like is the. You have three characters on a deserted island. Your characters have 
this character one has this good point and this bad point. So if we're only looking at the good point, how do they act? If we only look at the bad point, how do they act? But when those interact, how do they act now, right? So maybe you have a character who's, again, anxious, but they're caring. How do they act around people? Maybe they have difficulty talking to these people. Maybe they are not able to share what they want to say, but they show through their actions that they care about these people. So they're the person who's always the first one to walk over and give you a band-aid. Maybe you have a character who's really childish, but also here they feel very heroic. So they're probably going to be doing things that get them into trouble a lot, right? Like their ideas and logic might not be right they'll think oh we need we need to eat so clearly we need to go catch a you know we need to go kill a pig or whatever do they know how to kill a pig have they seen any pigs on this island right are they actually able to kill a pig or find a pig or track a pig maybe they don't know but they're just gonna pick up a stick or a rock and go out into the woods and start looking versus you might have another character who is a lot more mature and might know, hey, wait, how are we going to do this? How would we cook it? I don't know how to cook a pig to you, but we need to make sure we're looking at how those interact, right? Also, good characters need two things, internal conflict, external conflict. It was not intended to be Lord of the Flies, but yes, it did, it did go that way, right? Um, internal conflict. What do I want? What do I need? Right? What am I worried about? If you're, again, with that anxious character, maybe they want to get over their anxiety. Yeah, maybe they're going to get gored by the pig, right? That bo that that childish but heroic character, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that conch back. So we're going through and we're seeing how do these interact? How does that make our character more 3D? So these are skills we can teach as we're doing the back breakdown. And depending on time, you can spend a lot of time or a little time on this, depending on level. You can change how you're looking at it, how you're talking about it. So it's really, really easy to differentiate when you're going through and teaching these skills. So nitty gritty pieces. And this is where I'm in a minute, I'm going to need you Satan and you Spectre. So one thing I do, um, there's lots of different activities. That Nano Remo textbook has a ton of things, but there's lots of other different activities we can do. So I'm going to share two that I really like to do. One of them was actually introduced to me by Coffee Quills. Uh, when Coffee Quills came and did a presentation for my class. And I found it really, really, really works well. Um, and I'm going to talk about some trouble areas. Uh, the students usually have trouble coming up with ideas. How do they get inspired in the middle of their story when, you know, they hit that writer's block? And what are some trouble areas for both students and teachers? And then I'll share what I have used, a little bit of what I've used as the rubric in the past. Um, let's get going. So first thing, let's plot. Lady, open your jam board. <laughs> Thank you for my reminder, me. All right, da, 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 da. here we go. Here's my jam board. So we go through, oops, someone moved my stuff. On the board, we'll just draw the plot arc. We don't have these sticky notes unless we want them. And I'll ask the students for help. So right now, chat, you're my students. I need your help. I need a character. Give me a name. Give me a name. Any name. I need two characters, actually. I'll take the first two names. I also need two, a positive and a negative per, uh, point, like characteristic about the characters. So I have a Jared. Okay. That That's not a human name. Okay. Rawl. Okay. We've got Rawl and Jared. All right, I need a positive and a negative perk for Jared, a positive and a negative point for Rolf. Can be anything. Are they kind? Are they mean? Are they nasty? Are they self-centered? So we're going to write a story together using this information, so just keep that in mind. For either character, just give me anything. Jared is impulsive. Okay, I also need a positive point for Jared then. I'm just going with the first thing I see. How about Rawl? 
Jared still needs a positive point. Raul needs a positive and negative point. Anything. Throw it out there. Doesn't matter. Raul is attentive. Okay. So now we need a negative point for him and a positive point for Jared. Doesn't matter what it is. It's really weird not being able to see my audience. So Rawl is self-centered. They're attentive, but they're self-centered. Okay. So those would usually not be used together, I think, but that could work. It could work. There's a space cadet. Okay. So we have his job. He's a space cadet. How about Jared? We need a good point for him. Is he outgoing? Is he... I don't know. Let me think. Is he caring? Does he put his friends above everything? Okay, Jared's sure, a police officer. Okay. We have a job. I, I wasn't looking for a job, but hey, we can work with it. Jared is kind and charismatic. Okay, we're going to go with... I'm going to go with charismatic just because it might make it a little easier. Charismatic slash kind. Okay, we'll do both. Okay, Jared is a philanthropist. <laughs> Y'all, okay. All right, thank you. I appreciate you. Okay, so we have Paul, Rawl, sorry, and Jared. Where are they? I need a place. This can be a city. It can be a planet. This can be anything. Maybe they, they live together at, you know, 502 South Water Street. I don't know. The Bahamas. Okay. So maybe we're on vacation, right? All right. What is our problem? Maybe we don't know the problem yet. That's okay. So let's look at our characters. We have someone who's charismatic and kind, but impulsive. We have someone who's self-centered, but they're also attentive. And they're in the Bahamas. All right. So looking at this information, just from their job, probably we wouldn't expect normally an interaction between these two. So let's look at the place. Does the place give us any ideas? They're in the Bahamas. Maybe they're on vacation. I'm exp I'm just very simply doing this. We would let the kids do more thinking. Maybe the kids can make some of the connections, but this is just an example. Okay. So problem would be their a relationship. Okay. All right. So they're in the Bahamas. Maybe they're on vacation. All right. So we have the start of a story. So what happens in our setup? So if we're telling this, let's say, from Jared's point of view. So he's tired. He's burnt out. Goes on vacation. To the Bahamas. And maybe, you know inciting incident. What is going to start this problem? So if our problem is that they want to be together, but the one is a space cadet and they can't, right? Inciting incident, they are, I don't know, they're playing water polo at the hotel. I'm, again, it really doesn't matter what this is. The point is just to give kids an idea of how you could make a random plot based on just this much little information, this little information, right? Playing water at the hotel and meets, meets Rawl, right? What happens in this rising action, right? Maybe he gets, gets to know Rawl. Maybe there's a point where Rawl is uh, doing something, you know, he's self-centered, he's doing something, maybe he gets hurt. And Jared helps him or whatever. Or the other way around. Jared's the impulsive one, right? Maybe Jared is doing something impulsive, doing something crazy. And gets hurt. Right. There go and they talk. Maybe there's a relationship. Maybe relationship? Question mark? They're talking together. They're hanging out. Maybe someone brings this up. And then we learn about why we can't, right? Jared forgot to pack a life jacket for the pool again. All right. Let's, let's add that. Let's see. He forgot 
a life jacket. He can't swim. This is new information, right? Right? But tries to show off. And gets, you know, and almost drowns. He's saved. Saved by Brawl. Maybe later then, because of this, Jared admits the feelings. Right? Admits the feelings. But Rawl says, nah. Right. Drowns is... Okay, all right, you guys keep adding information. I love it. I love it. It's saved by Rawl. All right, he's saved by Rawl. We're just going to leave it at that. Rawl says, nah. Something happens. Right. Rawl says, nah. <laughs> Something happens, right? Maybe it's time... You know, you're so into this. I appreciate it. We are running out of time, though, so I am going to move on a little bit. A little bit. So Rawl says, nah. So this is something where, you know, this is a hiccup in your story. Jared's crushed, right? Now, on our plot arc, what I usually introduce is I just introduce that simple one plot arc. You have an inciting incident, you rise, you hit a climax, you get a falling action. But when you're coming through this, you often get stuck like this, right? We're rising, we're rising, he gets saved, he admits he likes him. Nah, right? And this is a good moment to teach about midpoints. The first time Coffee did this activity with my students, um, the main character died at the midpoint. <laughs> it took us a minute, but we figured out, okay, so now they're a ghost and they have to figure out how to be human again. And then they go to beat them, right? So... He's crushed. He says no. Something happens and we got to get to the climax. So what is our climax? What's our resolution? Do they get together? Do they go their own way? What do we want, chat? What do we want? Are they going to get together? Are they going to go? Are they going to understand each other and just go their own way? What do you want? Or something else entirely. Maybe a meteor crushes into the earth and everyone dies. The end. <laughs> They're together forever. Okay. So I'm just because we're running out of time, it's gonna write question, question, question mark, profit forever together. Okay. So something happens, they get together, they admit their feelings, and then in their falling action, they're oh wait, sorry, I put that in the wrong spot. Something happens, right, in this section. They finally admit to their feelings. They get together. Oops, together. And then following action, the happily ever after. Maybe, maybe Jared is seeing, uh, seeing Roll off on his next adventure. Usually when I do this in class, I would take around 30 minutes, 40 minutes, depending on the speed and level of the kids. And we would go through it together and I'd ask the kids for input. Okay, so we have these characters, we have this place, maybe we don't know the problem yet, but let's talk about it. Let's figure out, like you guys said, okay, now this is a relationship, right? Maybe you're like most of my students and you like murder. You like murder so much you just want to write a murder story 70 percent of my students want to write murder stories and i approve of fictional murder but we'll come back to that later we're running out of time okay someone should write a cheesy short, short story about this now <laughs> right so we go through we work together to do this and now we see oh hey look yeah students especially junior high school and high school students love murder they love mystery they they dig it it's edgy they're edgy so i roll with it but we go through we do this it takes us usually around 30 minutes to a whole class hour and by the end of it they're more confident with feeling like they can write their own story even if they don't know what they want when they make their characters they can get an idea based on who are your characters where are you and what they want 
if our place was, say, Mars, <laughs> maybe we have a completely different story. If we're in the ruined city of New York, maybe we're in a dystopian world, right? So just having just this little information can really help them to spark ideas. All right, let's go ahead and in just a minute, Satan and Spectre, I'm going to need you guys on that Jamboard if you'd like to open your Jamboard. So another activity I really like is helping the kids with figuring out dialogue. Again, if we just tell the kids rules, they don't, they don't remember it. They don't use it. And they're like, oh, wait, what? You told us that? But if the kids understand what it looks like, it feels different. So if you've ever done written role play, it's going to be really familiar. Um, but essentially, you start the kids with a prompt if needed, or you give them a blank piece of paper. I usually put the kids in a group of three to four, and each group would have one about two prompts or more going around simultaneously. And the key for this is usually you'll set a timer, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, however long you're going to do. And one student starts a line of dialogue. They're allowed only the dialogue and a dialogue tag. And then they pass it to the next person once they finish one line of dialogue. And they have to continue the story until there's absolutely no way to continue the story using only dialogue. So, Spectre, Satan, I have on this Jamboard, here's our example. So I would usually use a piece of paper for this, but we're going to use a Jamboard so you guys can see it. I've used uh, this website here for my prompts. So an example, here's my prompt. You must continue the dialogue. Person one, person two, person one, person two. We're going to have four people. You don't need that link. You don't need that link, Spectre. Go away. You don't need it. <laughs> right? So this is what it looks like. So I'm going to give them five minutes while we keep talking to do the team one prompt. So Satan, I'm going to have you be number one. Spectre, you're going to be number two. Okay? So our prompt is, sweetheart, what did you bury in the garden? Satan, I want you to respond to this with whatever you want, but it can only be a line of dialogue plus a dialogue tag, which is like she said. And then whatever you say, Spectre has to respond to. And whatever Spectre says, you have to respond to. You're going to run out of these. So... We're going to copy paste these over just to make it easy. You can just keep going like this until I tell you time is up. All right. Let me erase that for you. So while they're working on that in the background, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Okay. All right. So Satan, you're number one. Ready? Satan's number one. All right. So what Satan responds, you can run. All right. Hey, someone said Satan. There's corn now. All right, I'm setting a five minute timer. Ready, set, and you can start writing. All right, write as much as you can. I'm gonna go back to this while you guys write that. And we'll come back and check in on it. So you're gonna have the kids do this. And while they're doing this, or not while they're doing it, after they do it, what you do is have them look at the different stories they've written and ask them which one is better. Sometimes you get stories that are really boring, like, oh, hey, did you buy the milk? What? The milk? Oh, uh, no. Can you buy milk? Yes. You get really boring stuff like that sometimes, and it's totally, you know, it's okay. It gives the kids a chance when they're comparing these to see what is a good conversation and story, what's a bad conversation. And after they decide which one's better, we ask, okay, can you come up with good rules for dialogue? Um, the three things you want them to hit on is dialogue should progress your story. It should reveal something about the character, tell us information we didn't know before, or add tension. And for kids, of course, we're keeping it simple. So for kids writing, these are the three basic rules we need to have. All right, you guys got three and a half minutes. I hope you're writing over there. So we're going to come back and we're going to check in on what they said, but we are getting close to out of time. So idea generation how do you help the kids get ideas so doing things like the dialogue pass 
has really helped the kids come up with ideas. They're like, oh yeah, we did this this thing and it was really interesting, so I wanted to keep doing it. Doing that story plot on the board together, I've had some kids decide they want to try to use that or the start of that as their story. I also have used bell ringers in the past, so every day or every week, depending on your kids' level, I give a new prompt, or I'll give them a couple prompts to choose from. I've also done things, and some of these are in the NaNoWriMo textbook, noun listing. So give them five minutes and they can write just whatever they think of. And then they have to choose three and try to figure out, okay, how could I make a story out of this? Give them what if scenarios, like, Okay, guys, so what if clouds were made of cheese? <laughs> what if, um, let's see, what if Tokyo never existed? Right? So just these, they're, these may seem really simple to us, but for kids, they need permission to do these simple things sometimes. Alternate fairy tales, starting them off with, okay, we're going to write Cinderella, but now you're the villain. We're going to start, we're going to do Cinderella, but, you know, the fairy godmother never showed up. Um, also, using their personal history, asking them to write stories about their life. Anything that they've gone through, been through, can also be starting points for stories. And the kids just need permission to use that in their writing, to know that it's okay to share those ideas. Um, as for inspiration, like when the kids are stuck, you guys have a minute and a half, by the way, I hope you're writing. Um, when they're stuck, what I've had kids do in the past and what I've recommended is things like talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk about their life stories or things they've been through. And you can get ideas from that. Go sit at a coffee shop and watch people and try to make up stories about their lives. Um, emotions. I actually had one kid who was really, really pissed off about this assignment. And her opening scene of her, her novel was her character being assigned to write a stupid book and this evil teacher didn't understand they had so much to do. And that, that was their opening scene to their book was being assigned this assignment and they were so mad about it. So using their daily emotions, getting mad at the train on the train, like they're cramped, they're uncomfortable. I've had kids use stuff like that in their books. Um, their own personal history, music, uh, their model novel for ideas sounding boards, asking their peers, asking their teacher. I tend to assign kids or ask the kids to choose one person who is their peer novelist. And that's the person that if they're stuck, they go to for help. Because that person should know about their story from start to beginning. And is basically helping them at every point along the way. This is a meme. This is not a meme. All right. Uh, image searches, like looking at, looking at Pinterest, things like that looking at a picture on Google and writing a story about it. Uh, I've actually asked the kids for feedback too. I'm going to give you guys a few more seconds, even though time's about up. Uh, this is actually what students have told me in the past that they have used. So listening to music, inspiration from a friend, reading poems, reading books, they reading action stories, looking at music lyrics. Okay, your time is up, but I'm coming back to you in a minute. Their daily life, the internet, they imagine their favorite place, their model novels, um, their imagination. What would they do if they were in the same situation? So showing these really simple things, they might seem simple to us, but to the kids, they, again, they need permission to do the simple things sometimes. All right. So they have finished their, their writing time. I hope you guys have finished writing. Let's switch over to y'all. All right, sweetheart. What did you bury in the garden? Oh, uh, I buried some gold I bought. I don't trust the bank. Okay, so we've gone from murder story to some paranoid person already. But I thought we went broke when I lost my job last week. Okay, we're already building tension. We're building knowledge. We're building background just from our, you know, just from our dialogue. Yeah, see, I took the money out. I bought the gold. So we have this nest egg. We'll be all right. The price of gold is going up. <laughs> the egg? What's in the egg? How much are we talking? The gold is the egg. It's a couple hundred at the moment, but if the price keeps going up, it'll be thousands in a few months. Well, you were smart. For, thanks for doing this for us. Of course, I love you. I want to make sure we have a good future. This is, this is, okay. Egg, first of all. But what we've done is we've built a story. 
just with dialogue, right? We've learned who these characters are. The one is maybe paranoid, doesn't trust the bank. Maybe there's something going on in the world. They're thinking ahead. Maybe they're a little bit idealistic that in a few months, the, the, the gold will be worth a couple of thousands of dollars from, uh, from a couple hundred. Character two has lost their job. Maybe that's a point of tension, right? It could have been anything. That's the thing with these with these plot points. I assumed it was going to be a murder, but it didn't end up being a murder, right? Our second character, they lost their job. Maybe that's been a problem in the story, right? Maybe they're not very smart. The egg, what's in the egg, <laughs> right? They're appreciative, appreciative and trusting of this person, right? So just from this alone, like this is a lot higher level writing than I would usually see with my students. But just from like this kind of activity, five minutes, we've already built a story. We've already got really good examples of good points for text, right? No, that's fine. That's the whole thing. It's improv improvisation. This could have very easily been, oh, you know, Ted. Ted. What do you mean, Ted? Yeah, uh, he pissed me off. Oh, it could have very easily been something like that, right? No, no, it's fine, Spectre, and that's the point. No one's good at timed, but in five minutes, we've built a story together that makes sense. Now, the more people you add to this, the more crazy it can get, and the easier it is for the kids to break down what um, is a good story or a bad story, what is good dialogue, what's bad dialogue, right? I was hoping to have enough people to have one more team, which was, I'm not really surprised that you murdered him, <laughs> but... <laughs> We did not, so that's fine. But so you guys can see just for five minutes, like we've got a story and we have content we can look at. Thank you, Satan. Thank you, Spectre. Appreciate it. All right. We are, we've got about 15, 20 minutes left and I want to try to give you time to ask questions. So stumbling blocks, ideas. What story do I write? Be nice to Ted. He has a family. <laughs> that darn dead. I love you guys. Hello, JDR. Welcome in. We are in the middle of an event, so thank you. Um, ideas. How do I write a story? What do I write a story about? So a lot of times kids have trouble with this, so doing things like we talked about with those other idea generation section can really help the kids to build things. I've had kids who had one of those bell ringer questions. They really liked what they wrote. They really liked the idea, and they turned that into their entire novel. Uh, yes, you may exit the board now. Um, a lot of them think that their writing is stupid, their grammar is stupid, their ideas are stupid, and they let that inner editor take over. So again, it's it feels really dumb, <laughs> but in the NaNoWriMo textbook, there's a button, that's the inner editor button, and you cross it out and you crumple it up. And what I like to do is have the kids cross it out, crumple it up, and then we put it in a box and I close the box and they're not allowed to have the inner editors back until NaNoWriMo is over. And just that is just giving them permission to not be perfect. And that really helps them to be free with their language and to try things that are scary because they're not, no one is judging the work. The word count, um, NaNoWriMo does have this official suggested word count list, but when you're working with EFL and ESL students, you have to keep in mind that this suggested word count is for native speakers of English. So what I usually do is I'll bump it down. I'll give the kids a range like, okay, I'm going to expect from this class between 5,000 and 6,000 words. And then I have meetings with the kids about two weeks before we start writing. And I ask them to set their own goal in that range. And that way, if I think that they've set something that's too ambitious for themselves, we can bring it down. If they've set something that's not ambitious enough for themselves, we can bring it up. And at that time, we also come, they talk about what they're thinking about writing. So I usually have an earlier meeting, too, for what are you thinking about writing? And then in this one, we kind of, quote unquote, finalize it. But having that time to talk to you and set their goal makes them feel like they have control, makes them more likely to want to work on it, and makes them feel more confident going into it. And as well as you, you can make sure the kids are performing at a differentiated level um, for what is appropriate for them. Sometimes the kids have multiple ideas. They don't know what to write. It's just telling them, write both. Don't delete it. Maybe you can use it later. Um, 
the one stumbling block for teachers is the topic. I do recommend on avoiding limitations. If, for example, you're doing a unit on dystopian writing and it has to be dystopian, all right, you know, whatever, that's cool. But if you're just having them do this kind of writing without any link to any other part of your curriculum, avoid limiting things if possible. I do understand in countries like the US, uh, there might be some more trouble with certain themes, certain topics. Um, I work in Japan and we don't have as many of the issues that can be present in other places. So I had a student who had a book called School Bombed and was about this person trying to stop, you know, this thing happening at their school. That kind of topic might not be appropriate for some countries, for some places, but being as where we are and the lack of taboos around that subject in education in Japan, I was able to allow it. But when possible, I would avoid putting limitations on things. Um, I've also asked kids if they're allowed, or kids have also asked me if they're allowed to swear in their books. And I tell them, yes, but it should be limited and thoughtful and serve a purpose. Like it should follow those dialogue rules. It shouldn't be every other word, but if you have two or three F words in your book, I won't get mad. Um, of course, I'm also teaching high school aged students. In Japan, they're junior high school, but in the US, they would have been high school aged or eighth grade, depending on the year that I was teaching. Um, but removing limitations can help the kids. It could be the opposite. Maybe for your kids, you find that you have a bunch of kids who are really struggling because there's no limitations. In that case, then adding a limitation, such as a genre, could help them out a lot. Um, something else I also found my kids struggled with was they didn't really understand their genres or what, for example, they wanted to write a science fiction book, but they didn't really know what a science fiction book does. So I've had times where we did, um, what was it? It was genre research. So I set the kids in groups and gave each group a different genre. Um, when possible, I let them, you know, say what genres they're interested in writing and tried to give them their first or second choice for research. But then in that group, they have to research what is this genre? Like, what is special about it? What do the characters, the places, things like that look like? And they had to make presentations and share those with everyone. So it really helped them to understand their own topic before they started writing it, or their own genre before they started writing in it. And it helped them get more ideas of what their world should look like and should include. All right, so the rubric. This is gonna depend on your own situation, of course. For me at the school I was at, I had mostly complete freedom, but I had a rule that I was required to grade grammar and spelling errors. But I would be sure whatever your rubric is, whatever, if you're doing this on an IB system, if you're doing this on a, another kind of system, if you're just doing this regularly, make sure whatever your rubric is that you're very clear, you are not judging if this is a good story. Okay, this is not judging the quality of their writing. I'm also going to share this, uh, what I'm about to share in just a moment in chat. So if you want to see that up close, you'll be able to see it there. You should be able to see it. If you can't, let me know. But I'm telling the kids I'm not judging you based on the quality of your story really helps the kids feel relieved and feel f more free to write it. Um, again, be objective with your rubric. Like, it's not, oh, is it good dialogue? It's do you have dialogue, right? Do, does this kind of thing exist, right? Does it use this technique? Is it original? If you are grading the entire novel and not asking kids to submit just an excerpt of it, especially if you are working with higher level EFL, ESL, or native students, I would recommend limiting this to say, I, I'll only grade grammar and spelling on the first two, one to two pages. Um, but this is, and again, I just shared the link for this in chat. This is the rubric, one of the rubrics I used at my old school. And with the student copy, it was just like excellent, average, you know, beginner, you know, stuff like that on the left. So they didn't see the point divide. 
but I've set it up to where the students, when I'm giving them that feedback, they can go in and they can look and see what constitutes success at this level, right? But Spectre, there are things when you're an EFL ESL teacher, uh, you are required to, to some level, to grade grammar and spelling. As I said, at my school, they required, no matter what the task was, I was required to grade grammar and spelling, which was our skull and crossbones list, as that school called it. But I set it to every two unique errors would be deduct one point. But it, it, it is, I agree to some extent, but at the same time, if your story does not have good grammar, if it doesn't have good spelling, that can affect communication. And if it affects your communication, I think personally that's where it should affect a rubric. But again, I did not have control over that at this school that I taught at previously, which is where the example of this rubric is coming from. Um, so I did not get to choose that. But so for at the highest level for dialogue, for example, I had things like you have lots of dialogue, which again, the word ample could be a little vague, but it's still more towards that objective, right? The dialogue is realistic and effective. Like it sounds like something people would actually say in that situation. It's most often used to advance the plot. They're using it to increase tension and define characters. They follow the four dialogue rules. They use correct punctuation and a variety of speech verbs. The next level down, a good amount. It's generally realistic, effective. They use, they make effort to use dialogue to increase tension, define characters. They almost always follow the rules of dialogue, right? And they almost always use the right grammar. Versus the novel has little dialogue. You know, it's not generally realistic or effective. They make little effort to use it to increase tension or define characters. They rarely follow these rules. Very little to no dialogue, where their dialogue is things like woof. Yes, I have had kids try to write woof and meow in quotation marks before. That was a day. <laughs> or they don't use it almost all the time. So like making an objective really makes it clear and more comfortable for the students and yourself. And again, whether you're having the kids submit their whole novel or just excerpts of their novel is up to you. What goes into that rubric depends on what standards you're grading, what criteria you're looking at. For me, dialogue was one of my big things that I really wanted to work with them on because dialogue and quotation mark rules also applies to things that they use in other kinds of academic writing. Like if you're citing something, the same general rules for quotation marks and commas apply to that. So I was really hammered at it and so I made dialogue its own category. All right, we've got just about 12 minutes left. So kids have written their book, you've gone through all of this, you've differentiated by their level, you've worked with kids individually. I, again, uh, I didn't say this before, but I like to set aside whatever our writing time is, that's all they do. If possible, I change the space. No matter what level the kids are, EFL, ESL, or native writings, change writers changing that space or letting them sit on the floor or whatever they want to do during that time, letting them listen to music, even if it breaks school rules a little bit sometimes. I've definitely broken rules for this. Letting them be comfortable while they're writing can help. But once they finish, if you have time in your curriculum, you can go through and revise it. You can guys can go through, you can self-publish it by printing it at school, or you can use some of the options like the Nano NaNoWriMo, NaNoWriMo, not Young Writers Program have discounts for companies like Blurb, where you can publish everyone's book together. You can give awards, do class photos. If rewards are part of your system, you can give rewards. I have found that the kids really love to read each other's stories. Anytime I have uh, printed either just individual copies that were just printed and bound at school by myself, or when we put the book together and published it, the first thing the kids did was grab their friend's book and start reading it. Tattle all you want. The kids love it. Um, but they love reading each other's stories. So having a reading party can be really good. 
and their fr the friends always get embarrassed like no don't read my story but everyone really really i feel improve their language they improve their writing skills they improve their reading and analysis skills and they get a lot more confidence in their english and they're able to be using this authentic english the whole time um but this is just a really i know it's been an hour but this is a brief overview of what i do with this how i work on all this with the kids if you have any questions or like want to talk directly with me about things as well i am my my dms are open on twitch or discord if you want to ask about this or talk about this um additional notes there are things like motivational tools you can get for free as a teacher for up to i think one or two classrooms worth of supplies like using progress charts Letting the kids put a sticker every time they hit a percentage goal really has helped motivate kids in the past. Um, using these like badges as stickers you can get for free from these as like, hey, anyone who hits 25% gets a sticker. You know, when you hit 30% or whatever you want to set it as, you get your, you know, your badge. Like I would set those goals low to make sure everyone can get them, but it also helps them motivate them. There's also things like, I'm sure some of you guys have uh, listened to this song that I won't play all of because I don't want to get DMCA'd, but there's lots of NaNoWriMo songs you can listen to on YouTube. Um, Pep Talks for Writers is also a really good resource. Um, I've asked students in the past what they liked about it, what they thought they were successful at, um, and I felt like kids really were aware of how they were successful. I've asked them about the skills or strategies they thought that would be useful for them. Um, and I've asked them to give advice and a lot of them give time, advice about using your time wisely. It's painful, be ready for it. But some of them, you know, give advice, like if you're stuck, skip that scene and come back later. So they've learned these strategies that can help them with other tasks as well and are really able to put it into words, so to speak. Um, but that said, I was hoping to give you guys more time for this, but if there are any questions now, this would be the time. We have seven, eight minutes left before we got to raid off. So if you have any questions, any comments, please do ask them in the chat now. Again, if you would like to, you are also welcome to reach out to me in uh, Twitch messages or on Discord, and I'm happy to answer questions based on my experience. But I hope this was useful. I hope this helped you guys understand more about what it looks like to teach this kind of writing. Um, but of course, I couldn't, I can't cover it all in an hour. So you want me as your teacher? Thank you. I appreciate that specter. You, you know, the kids, they don't always appreciate it, but it helps them in the long run. So but if there's any questions, um, feel free to type them in chat or use that highlight message button. Like seven minutes left. I'll give you guys just a minute to write while I copy this stuff. This is epic, lady. Amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. You guys, you guys are too sweet. Here's the thing. There is a lot of boring stuff we have to do. Like when we're going through and talking about characters, we're looking at what we need. How do we describe characters? There are things we have to do like grammar drill tasks like some of my kids don't know how to use adjectives very well some of them can't use comparative language and we have to do things like that throughout this process for this kind of unit i like to do the NaNoWriMo Young Writers Program Challenge in its entirety so I usually for this entire unit will set three months we spend two months examining stories looking at how to build stories what do they need? What does it look like? What is the grammar we need, right? And then for that month, we just write. Every day, all day. Um, the kids really like using the NaNoWriMo Young Writers Program website because as they're hitting their goals, like as they're hitting like 10%, 20%, 25%, the website dings and then we can all cheer and clap together. And they look really embarrassed, but I've had a lot of feedback from um, kids the last year I did this at that school um, that they really, they were embarrassed by, but they really enjoyed and appreciated it. Um, and they said it really helped them feel more confident going through their stuff. 
Um, but we do have about six minutes left if there's anything else that you guys would like to talk about, ask questions for. I was really nervous going into this. I'm glad I was able to relax and just talk confidently. I felt like my student before speaking to us today, just going, ya bye, ya bye. Yari takenai mo dame da. The whole time, just, I can't do this. Oh my God, panic. Uh, or any questions about teaching for writing in general? Otherwise, we can go ahead and... I was perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. We can go ahead and I've got this URL here. Um, which goes directly to the workbook. Uh, but we can go through, we can look through a couple pages. We got five more minutes. So this workbook, again, it's really, really amazing. It really breaks things down and makes it fun and exciting. Uh, earlier, we did talk about the inner editor containment button. And again, this is a really powerful tool. Cross this out, stab it, punch it. Don't break it, though, because, you know, you need it back later. Crumple it up, lock it in a box. Don't let it out until you're done. It really, really does help the kids. And during their writing, if the kids start going like, oh, I want to say this, but my grammar is terrible, or I can't do this because da 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 I go, wait a minute, did, did, is your inner editor calling you right now from, from jail or from, you know, from the, from the lockbox or whatever word I've used for it that year? Because, you know, they can't hurt you. They're, they're in that box in that other room or they're in that box in that closet. They can't, they can't hurt you. So you can just hang up the phone and just giving kids permission really helps them. Um, I still have Jelly Beans inner editor in a desk drawer upstairs from a couple years ago. Nice. <laughs> but again, the kids, they just, they can do it. No matter their level, they can do it. They just need permission. They need permission to not have a perfect story to not have a perfect character, to not have a perfect plot, to not have perfect everything, to not have perfect grammar. They need permission to do that. And that is one thing I feel like I spend the most time doing with the kids. Um, also during their writing month, they, of course, I always give them a peer novelist that these kids are the ones who work together for their whole book. They should know the other person's characters and general plot and they can help them when they're having trouble. But I always walk around and ask the kids, you having trouble? Are we stuck? Do we need any help? How's it going? You know, how's, you know, what part of the story are we on now? Are you stuck on anything? And I'll sit down and ask questions or I'll have kids go, I have this character, I'm doing this, but I, I don't know what to do next. Or like, I want it to get here, but I don't know what to do. And offering them ideas, just if even just crazy or simple ones can really help them to kind of unlock those ideas. Um, but that said, we do have only two minutes left. So there's things like what makes a novel a novel? Again, that model novel I talked about, this really goes through and breaks it down. Like, why do you think this character is important, right? What perspective is the story written in? And a lot of EFL, ESL students will use first person. It's what they're most comfortable using. They use it in their daily life. It's the one that they use all the time. So third person, second person is extremely rare to see with EFL, ESL students. And that's not, pro that's not a problem. Multiple perspectives. Kids have trouble deciding if they want to do this. Um, there's book talks. I've done book talks before and they have to use all that stuff and explain about that book. And it really helps them to think about what makes a good book. Love it or leave it. Just simply writing down things that they love or they don't love and why helps them to figure out what they can do when they're writing their own book. Here's that thing like listing nouns like or just whatever, sparking an idea and then putting it out. Uh, creating interesting characters, flat versus complex, right? This book has been updated. This was not in um, the version I've used previously. Last year, I was not using the NaNoWriMo program, so I didn't use this last year, but we will be incorporating it as a part of our curriculum for at least the next four years, starting from next year at my current school. And I'll be working on using this book and using my knowledge and background in this to help hundreds of more kids write their story. And we're actually gonna be publishing them through our school um, for the students as well. Um, there's also things like character questionnaires that really, you know, 
as all writers know, we all use those and then never look at them again. <laughs> Building conflict, right? What do they want? What might stop them? Do they have weaknesses, fears that'll help, that'll stop them from doing this right? So this workbook really does go through and it really breaks everything down, makes it interesting. And as a teacher, it's less prep. It's less you have to make, but it's also really good jumping off points. There's also the boring dialogue handout where they can try using dialogue and making little comics that the kids really do enjoy. But that said, we are at the end of our time. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for sitting through my nerves earlier today. Um, if you are a normal uh, <laughs> viewer on this channel, I appreciate you guys for following today's rules and listening to me be a <laughs> professional for once. Um, but that said, we are going to be writing into Writer's Conduit. The next available... Where did that go? The next available sessions are general discussions with Ellie Wake, it looks like. Or there will be one on writing trans characters um, that are coming up. So we are going to raid into the Writer's Conduit stream. And from there, you'll be able to move on to your next panel. Uh, I am going to start the raid, but if you do get dropped, please use that raid, uh, that link to go over to the current Writer's Conduit channel. Uh, also, you have 15 minutes before the next thing starts, so stand up, stretch, get a drink, get a snack. If it's that time of day, take your meds. Move around, be healthy, do something for you, and then go into that next panel nice and fresh and relaxed and ready to go. But that said, we are going to be raiding off. Thank you, lovely people, so much. I love your faces. Thank you for listening to me. Have a great day. We're going to raid off in just a moment. If you get lost or have questions, I will stick around in here. Um, or you can message me in Discord. Have a great day. All right, if you are still in here and you got dropped. All right, let me just, if you got dropped, please do use that link that I posted in chat just a minute ago. I cannot, um, hold on a moment. I'm trying to refresh my chat so that I can see if you guys are still here. If you're lost, if you have questions, um, I can stick around for just a moment. Let me just open my chat window in another tab. There we go. Maybe, oh, zombies. Here we go. Use my own chat. Alrighty. All right, but if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Otherwise, once again, you can message me in Discord. You can message me over in um, Twitch as well, and I'm happy to answer any questions. If you did get dropped from that raid, please use this link and head on over so you can head to the next one. There is currently a... Uh, general chatting session going on, but the next track one panel starting at 4.30 a.m. UCT is writing trans characters, and you'll be able to get there from the Writer's Conduit channel. That said, I am going to be ending for the day, so it seems like everyone has made it over. Have a great day. We love your faces. Have a great night.